And uh, so let us start the usual way. Uh, we were starting with the Greenberg last time, and I wonder if there were any thoughts, insights, questions that came up since we finished our class last week before I start the new one. Anything that you were wondering about, wanting to ask about, I don't see any of your hands raised. So let me go back to my PowerPoint presentation. So, uh, and put it where we need to put it today. And this is here. So as I told you uh, last time, Ulrich V. Greenberg uh, is indeed an extremely interesting poet. You can see in some of the, the writing, and there's a huge body of research and writing about the works of Ulrich V. Greenberg. It's interesting to see the contrast between the very vast, deep, abundant interest of academia in the works of Ulrich V. Greenberg and much less of that in the popular readership. A, but if you read some of those scholars, and I even did a little bit more this morning to refresh myself, they would say even Dan Miron, who is the greater, greatest researcher and scholar of Nathan Alterman, will say with all my admiration of Alterman, I have to admit that Ulrich V. Greenberg is greater as a poet, as a language, as a creator, imagination and such. And you want to, I mean, those of you who have Ivrit and I know they are not many, can see that even like a literary critique such as Hanan Hever, and honest to God, you cannot be more left than Hanan Hever ideologically. It's absolutely impossible. You will fall off the end of the continuum. He is one of the most left-wing literary critiques in Israel. And he is a total admirer of Ulrich Greenberg's work as a poet. So what I want to say that regardless of whether you agree with him ideologically or not, and most of the critical, obviously there are right-wing critiques of Ulrich Greenberg like, like Weiss and others, but a, regardless of what a person may think of his ideology, there is a total admiration of his literary work and his place in Hebrew literature of the almost whole of the 20th century. So let us go back and we were looking at a poem that says a one truth, not two. And I mentioned it last time by saying that oftentimes in Israeli culture, a, there are people, members of Knesset, who quote a poetry to make a point. And there are two famous poems that keep getting quoted again and again and again. One of them is Alzot by Nathan Alterman dealing with war ethics and the conduct of the IDF. And it will be normally a people of the left wing that will quote him, sometimes even right wing for a reason. And then you will have one truth, not two, a metachat lo time. A by Ulrich V. Greenberg a, that is quoted very, very often. So these are the two like highlights of members of the Knesset, which suggest to you that indeed a, they are, it is a very ideological a, poem. And so let us just refresh our memory. It comes from a book, Sefer HaKitrug Veha which is important. The year is 1937. Ulrich V. Greenberg already had made the shift from socialist Zionism to revisionist Zionism to the Jabotinsky side. We said, I said actually what is the popular way to think about him that the cause for his shift was the massacre in Hebron. But reading further today, it turns out that they were thoughts already earlier when he becomes critical of Chaim Weizmann, of Ben-Gurion, etc. Uh, but this is not the matter. The matter is that if we look at uh, the three poems that we have looked at last time, 
So we obviously looked at a, if in Malchut von Salem, his prophecy, if you wish, of the annihilation of Jews by gas as an important one and often quoted. And then a, we went to a classical, another classic that I mentioned to you, I shall tell it to a child's ear, which is oftentimes quoted as a famous Ulrich Zvi Greenberg one, a, when you want to discuss the place of Yerushalayim. And just like some of you may have experienced a tour guides quoting tourists by Amichai at a certain point uh, when you're looking at the old city, in the same way, people who are of the belief that we should have kept control of Temple Mount, that we should have never left the old city back in the day, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, will quote, I shall tell it to a child by Oritz Greenberg. In the same way, one truth not to, is a popular one to quote when you make an ideological comment. And this is therefore the third one of the famous. And now I want to give you the fourth. And the fourth is famous for going deep into this rift thing, okay? A, when and where did left-wing Israel, social Zionist Israel, pioneering kibbutznik hashomer tzair, et cetera, type of Israel. When did they, by and large, not everybody, as I have said before, cut their ties? And I can take tell you of an example. I think I taught in our classes maybe once or twice poems by a contemporary poet. She is with us, 86 years old, Yudit Kafri, a very left-wing, very sensitive poet, woman a, of oftentimes biblical motifs and such. And she participates in a class that I'm teaching in Hebrew about Alterman. And in one of the classes, I said a word of comparison to Oritz V. Greenberg, and she burst out after that she apologized because she comes from the kibbutz of Hashomer Tzair. And this is, this poem will explain to you why a person, and I, I was expecting that. I, I didn't expect it to be this strong after so many years. So the poem I repeat again is from 1937. Not yesterday, you know, mm -hmm. maybe it's time for some forgiveness already. The people of Mishmar Emek of that time are gone, or it's with Greenberg is long gone, and yet the pain is still out there. So in this case, a, I am going to read all of the Ivrit, and if any of you is willing to do the English, I will accept uh, Judy, Jean, anybody of our regular readers, just let me know if you are willing. Is, uh, is there anybody who is willing to do the English? Just unmute yourself and let me know so I can call upon you in a minute. All right, no volunteers, so I'll do it myself. I call the signal. Let us listen to the Ivrit. It's very Oritzvi Greenbergy. Tachat kanfei albion hamagen, bedaat rovav hatovim la mokrav, efshar lehavlig milatset ulhagen, al achim hanuflim bemichmoret arav. Tachat kanfei albion hamagen, נוח לסלוח תועבות ערב. אפשר לקרוא ספר, אפשר לנגן, אפשר גם להיות קומוניסט שבכתב. תחת כנפי אלביון מברזל, מוצא מוגדת פסוקו המתאים, מוצא מוגדת פסוקו המתאים לקרב עם האימפריאליזם ועם המיליטריזם ועוד אם ואם. לכן כדין גדוד שנאחר מגינו למשמר העמק דבר הקלון, נפלת בכבודך בתרפת לערב, ונגאל בך מגן ישראל בתרצב. 
ויען בני חמדו בחלון, בוזים לצבא ובוטחים ברובב, היי ישימון במפת המדינה, עם טל בהרייך על עץ ועל טף, על טל בהרייך על עץ ועל טף, ואיש כי ישאל לאן הדרך מוליך, וענה העונה להפקר העמק. אוי, אה? I can see your face, Judy, בסדר. Do I still not have an English reader? I'll read it. Yeah, go ahead, Judy. Okay, go. Oh, there were others. Take, I... Somebody else wanted to read, and I've read a lot, so... Who did? I just couldn't see. I'm willing, not a problem. There, I can read. Who's the other who wanted to read? Just tell me the name. Rina. Rina. Go ahead, Rina, please. Under Albion's protective wings with its good fighting guns, one may hold back from stepping out to shield brothers falling into Arabia's fishing net. Under Albion's protective wings, how convenient to forgive Arabia's abomination. It is possible to read a book, to play music. It is even possible to be a communist in writing. Under Albion's iron wings, the coward finds a proper verse to battle with imperialism and militarism and with and with. Therefore, like a regiment's a sullied shield, shame on you, Mishmar HaEmek, your dignity bowed to Arabs in 1929, your shield vilified in 1936. For your sons stood at the winding window scorning the army and trusting its guns. May you turn into desert on the map of the state, no dew on your mountains, no tree nor infants. If anyone should ask where to, the res respondent responds, Hefker HaEmek. Hefker HaEmek, neglect instead of Mishmar, which is guarding. So I, I will go more into detail, but I'd like to just give you the framework. What would cause a Jewish Zionist committed person to curse a Jewish Zionist kibbutz? In the biblical curse, because you know Mishmar Emek geographically is just underneath in the shade of Mount Gilboa. And Mount Gilboa is the famous place that King David, before even he becomes a king or on the verge of becoming a king, is cursing immediately after King Shaul and his sons, especially Yonatan, David's friend, uh, lost their life in the battle against the Philistines. And King David that curses the mountain, Hareba Gilboa, Altal Val Matar Alechem, mountains of Gilboa, no dew, no rain upon you. And here is Oretz Vigreberg that many years again, and because of probably the, the geographical closeness, vicinity between Kibbutz Mishmar Emek uh, and Mount Gilboa, he is using the same text or an allusion to the same biblical curse. What had happened? You may want to ask. What had Kibbutz Mishmar HaEmek done in the year 1936 or 1937 to bring upon them the wrath of this prophetic poet who is so angry with them and that will cause a lifelong rift between Uri Tzvi Greenberg and Hashomer Atzair. Mishmar HaEmek is a Kibbutz of Hashomer Atzair. What did they do wrong? Would you like to guess, or maybe one of you knows? Yes, please, Matt, go ahead. Looking at the poem, I would guess they neglected to fight when they should have. They just sat there and didn't do anything when they should have been fighting. Okay, so there was something to do with the fight. Can you go ahead with your guessing with the text of the poem, Matt, or anybody else? And instead of fighting, what did they do? Maybe they prayed. Maybe they prayed. <laughs> In Kibbutz Shomer Tzair, no, that's a bit far-fetched. 
they must have, been, they must have, they must have um, in, developed good, tried to develop good relations with the Arabs or something like uh, that. It's not what they thought. They trusted the, the Brits. Oh. They they about the That's the reason. main sin. Albion, oh. okay? Albion is Britain, and they, Hassel Khalila, God forbid, had trusted the Brits, and therefore a... Let me just go back to where we need to be. Hang on for a minute. They trusted the Brits, and that is causing the anger of a Urzvi Greenberg with Kibbutz Mishmar Emek. So let me go again to the Ivrit. No, we did, that will do. Let's go to the English. So under Albion protective wings, what happened in Mishmar Emek? The Kibbutz was not physically attacked on that particular occasion. These are the riots of 36, 37. And when there is a reference to 29, you know it's the Hebron events. And 36, 37 is all across the country. So this is 37, the book appears in 37. And during these riots of the Arabs and attacks mainly on roads or Jewish settlements, the fields of Mishmar Emek were set to fire by Arabs. And rather than fighting back, the kibbutz trusts the British police to protect them or the British whatever forces. And this is what causes Ulrich V. Greenberg to be so mad. He cannot accept Jewish inactivism. He cannot accept Jews trusting somebody else. So under Albion's protective wings with its good uh, fighting guns, one may hold back from stepping out to shield brothers falling into Arabia's fishing net. And look at the, yeah, I will say metaphor. It's a horrible metaphor, but still it's a beautiful metaphor of perceiving the enemy was actually a peaceful image, but turned upside down because the Arabs have this fishing net, which normally is an okay metaphor, but in this case, very lethal because out of what the, the, the sea of the Zionism, the sea, metaphorically speaking, of the land of Israel, they want to fish the Jews out to consume them. And you can fall, you can, fail to help brothers who fell into Arabia's fishing net that is always there because you trust the Brits. Look at the repetition of the opening lines in the first three verses, Tachat Kanfe Albion and under Albion's uh, wings, etc. that changes a little bit, protective in the first two, iron in the third, but this repetition, this poetic repetition, always serves for emphasize, always serves for a, indeed, a strong, enthusiastic call. Under Albion's protective wing, second verse, how convenient to forgive Arabia's abomination. It is possible to read a book, to play music. It is even possible to be a communist in writing. So here goes Ortsvig Greenberg and slashing everything that Mishmara Emek or Kibbutzim alike would do. First of all, he doesn't trust their communism and socialism. That too is not strong enough by him. It's communist by writing. You are not true fighters of the communist cause and you occupy yourself with beautiful cultural activities and you write beautiful poetry, I would like to suggest that maybe there is a hint of the very popular poet of the time, Nathan Alterman, who had dared write the poem, Do Not Give Them Guns, Altit Nulaim Rovim, a very pacifistic poem. So whatever. I don't know if he really intends that, but I know it's of the same period. So, but there is a mockery of what the kibbutzim busy themselves with, 
when they should have been fighting. By the way, on the left hand side, you have an old picture of a Mishmara Emit and a more modern, newer one of today. We are into the third verse under Albion's iron wing. The coward, now, in case you had any hesitation about how he feels about Kibbutz Mishmara Emek, you shouldn't have any anymore because now he is calling it out. Coward finds a proper verse to battle with imperialism and militarism and with and with. So again, all this ideological verbiage, if you wish, that you could hear in meetings probably of socialist Zionists getting together of Histadrot and talking about the fight against imperialism and the fight against militarism. These are to Oritz Greenberg just words and words and proper verse not taken seriously. Therefore, like a regiment's solid shield, shame on you, Mishmar Haemi. But let us give a minute because for things that I tend to take in grant, uh, for granted and I shouldn't. Bishmar Emek is the name of a kibbutz, but we need to understand the meaning. Mishmar is the he who stands on guard. Mishmar Emek was created at the place where it was created at the southern entrance to the valley of Jezreel. And the Valley of Jezreel is really the, the capital of more modern socialist Halusic, Zionist pioneering. And that kibbutz was created there as the shield of the valley, ha Emek. Yeah, this is what you pretend to be, Mishmar Ha-Emek, the shield of the Emek, how so? Your dignity bowed to Arabs in 1929. Now that I'm not sure what Mishmara Emek have done wrong in 29. Maybe not caring enough about the riots in Hebron. Your shield vilified in 1936. This is when they accept the British protection and not standing up for themselves. For your son stood at the window scorning the army and trusting its guns. May you turn into desert on the map of the state. No dew on your mountains, no trees, no infants. Like, you know, wow. He is indeed angry and they are totally and truly insulted. And if anyone should ask where to, you know, that image of, of a person walking the, the beautiful sights of the valley of Emek Israel, and somebody asks him, no, Le'ana Derech, where are you going to? The respondent responds, Hefker Ha'emek. Hefker is neglect, Hefker is disregard. And what's interesting in the choice of word, of course, that it is. Meach, who's Hebrew, 100% Hebrew. But this is a word that would be used even in slang in Yiddish. So it, it is far reaching as a word of disdain, as a word which is exactly the opposite of Mishmar, of being the shield, of being the protectors of the Emek. So I can, I can really enumerate more than one or two or three great writers and people and voices of socialist Zionism. I mentioned to you, Judith Kafri, who is now I am proud to call a friend. I can mention to you people who are not my friends, but whom I admire, like Chaim Gori, who will say that, you know, I mentioned to you this uh, internet site called Ha'ivrim, Ivrim as in Hebrews, not blind. And there's a whole series about Oritzvi Greenberg and Chaim Gori uh, is one of the people interviewed about the greatness of the poetry of Oritzvi Greenberg, about which he will speak willingly. And then he reaches the point and he said that after the poem about Mishmar Emek, we couldn't. And there is just this body language where he raises his hands and he say, we couldn't. 
after the poem about Mishnah Emek, we couldn't. So uh, I will take any of your questions or comments about this before we continue, because I think that Dafka, uh, living the days that we are living and so many splits amongst us, I don't know how it helps or doesn't help to know that there were always splits amongst us. And there were always people who used hard language towards other Jewish groups. It's not an invention of today, you know, Smolanim, this, that, whatever. It existed before. And here it is, you know, in the text of a great poet. Yes, Matt, go ahead. And I see Eugene as well. I, this, is, this is bigger than Mishma Hamid. This is an indictment of the entire pacifist left. To, you know, I assume that's what got everybody upset even more. I mean, that, it applies now. There are people who are praying that something will happen, and there are people on the other end who say, I'm going out and fight and make what I want to happen happen. But this is, this is the other side. This is, you know, sending these people off to the desert <laughs> because they don't want to fight. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I am really harnessing myself because I think that there are many fighting people on the left and I would not want to check any of our fighting corpses as per the ticket they put in the ballots during elections. But yes, I totally agree that this is not only about Mishmara Emek. This is about, at that time, about people who preferred to trust the Brits for their protection rather to go out and fight. Let me remind you that at the very same time, these are the years where Ord Wingate arrives to the land of Israel, and he will be the one starting to train Haganah uh, uh, fighters, the, the Palmach to become in those years, to get out of the fences of the Kibbutzim and protect the land. And uh, so this battle, and no matter how uncomfortable it is to one side or the other, is indeed taking place in those years. So thank you for your comment. And Jean, are you still interested? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to say that whenever I see the word Albion, I think an English speaker will think of perfidious Albion. And I'm not yeah. sure that applies to Hebrew, but it, it jumps out that, you know, you, you often see Albion combined with the word perfidious Albion. Not in my mind, obviously. No, I might not have been in his mind either, but it certainly yeah. would strike an English reader. What, what striked me with the use of word Albion and Arabia here is that Alterman uses the same two expression, Albion and Arabia, in the poem he writes a, on a November 30th, immediately after the November 29th in 1947. So 10 years later, a, after the petition decision, and he writes about Albion and Arabia in a very similar conjunction. So that leads me to believe that indeed in the po poetic usage of the time, this was a nice way to, uh, to refer uh, to, to, to the Brits. This is what I'm thinking. I don't think that, uh, well, totally, I would not have made that connection. And then that needs to come from a deeper British sources than I have, of which, of course, I have none. And, and thank you for that. And Judy, go ahead. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure how to frame the question, but I'm, I'm, I guess it's just to say I'm, I'm a bit confused by especially Matt's um, characterization of the, of the left in these days of being pacifist, I mean, they were hardly pacifists. They were, they were fighters, as you said, Rachel. Um, I mean, the 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 kibbutz movement, the the labor movement, all of these, all of those that form the the fighting body of the state, even if they did accept the the uh, help of the British. Um, some more than others, they were hardly pacifist in the sense of put down your arms and let's <laughs> let's yeah. make peace and sing kumbaya. I mean, they also were among the as as you said, their bodies are <laughs> yeah. there are and many I, bodies. I, I to really say would not them. like to have to check a, every single one of the Air Force pilots who have been bombing Gaza for the last ten days 
to it, what I, they have I, voted. But there is absolutely. Briefly? Pardon? If I, if I could respond to that briefly. Yes, of course you can. I was not, I was not saying all the kibbutzim were, pro, were, were cowards. I was not saying that they're all pacifists. I was saying that this poem is anti pacifist, whoever they are, even if there's only five in the country, this guy is angry with them. That okay. is correct. That I can live with very easily. And of course, who is the greatest pacifist at the time, by the way? Who is the ideologist on the other side to which the Oritzvi Greenberg poetry speaks? It's not Ben Gurion, it's Buber. Buber and Brit Shalom. Okay. And, and, and you may remember those of you who have read a, a Tale of Love and Darkness. Anybody, can I see a quick show of hands? All right, so the young Amos Oz, the child, is of course raised in a revisionist home, the Klausner home, Professor Kla and, and they go to, the, to the, the uncle, the great uncle, who is of course a revisionist, and there are all these uh, people invited, the great scholars of Hebrew U at the time, Agnon included because he lives around in Telpiot. And then who is the person that is unmentionable and is not to be invited? It's of course Buber. So, so, so the, that thing is indeed part of the language of the time. And Matt is not out of place to, to mention the pacifist, all, although I, I, again, as I said, nowadays, I would not really want to check among the fighting forces who is left and who is right, and enough with that. Yeah, okay, to Daraba. Nowadays, to hold these conversations and still remain respectful of each other, that in itself is an achievement. L any more on Migdala Emek? Yes, please, Esther. Please unmute. Wanted to ask, could you mention some other Kibbutz Sim that shared the views of Mishma HaEmek regarding British health, and was this a common? Oh. This is the first time I hear of this. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, Besedil. So Esther, the anger at Oritzvi Greenberg is not just by Mishma HaEmek at that time; it's the whole of a Shomer Tzair. Mm -hmm. But again, in to put this in perspective, to put this in perspective. And not to be angry just at Oritzvi Greenberg. And to show you how this conversation is among us throughout the years. If you did not hear about the critique of Mishmar Emek by Oritzvi Greenberg because they were not activist enough. Did any of you hear about the case of Kibbutz Nitzanim in 1948? Okay. Kibbutz Nisanim, who is now under shelling for 10 days, always appearing as one of the names on your TV screen because it's very close to Ashkelon, okay? Uh, for the sake of transparency, I have family in Kibbutz Nitzanim. I am very close to this kibbutz. Kibbutz Nitzanim, during the war in 1948, when many of their members had fallen in battle when women and children, but for the women who continued fighting or the nurse, a, decided at a certain point to abandon and retreat, giving, letting the Egyptian army move ahead, practically all the way almost to Rehovot. And then they came back and reestablished the kibbutz. A, the head of whatever, morale and culture in the very young IDF at the time was Abba Kovner, the great hero of the Vilna Ghetto, the great hero of the partisans, the greatest of the witnesses against Eichmann in the Eichmann trial, a great poet in his own right. And he writes after the Nitzanim retreat, and Oritzvi Greenberg like not poem, it's called Daf Kravi, a battle page, pulling them down to the ground for shame, for not standing up, for not fighting until the last person, 
as Yad Mordechai did, as other places. I can tell you, first of all, 32 members of the kibbutz have died, you know, fighting for the kibbutz. It's not that they didn't fight. Actually, some people tried to create reconciliation between Abba Korner and Kibbutz Nisanin. It never really happened. I mean, they did meet, he did apologize later on. It never really helped. The insult, the hurt, the pain never left that kibbutz. To this very day, just like you cannot say Oritzvi Greenberg in Mishmara Emek, you cannot say Abba Kovner in Kibbutz Nitzanid. You know, these self-critiques amongst ourselves and probably not really understanding or going to the effort of seeing things from the other side. What was the decision that brought about the conduct in Mishmar Emek to trust the Brits and not get in? Did they have any fighters in 1936 or seven? Did they have any guns? Was there anything they could do? You know, we don't know. We know that they trusted the Brits and Orzvi Greenberg shamed them for that, Yofi. We know that Kibbutz Nitzanim retreated at what cost and when and so on. So these are questions that are with us constantly and uh, therefore as, as Esther said, she had not heard about it, but I would say that if I, and it's not if, it, it is my intention. If I want to create an all three vocabulary in our midst, then we need to go from in the land of the cross to, I will tell it to a child, to one truth, not two, and to Mishmar Emek. And now you have at least some of the building blocks of the poetic inner conversation, the ideological political poetry of the time. And now I'll be asking you to set it aside because in this class and hopefully next week as we conclude the Omer series, we are looking at a body of Oritzvi Greenberg's poetry that does have political elements and ideological elements in it. But they are all put aside because his becomes the greatest poetic lamentation of the Shoah in Israel in a category, in a league of its own, not compare, compared or comparable to anybody else. So again, even Guri, who will say, oh, but after Mishmar Emek, and then he will add, but then came Rechovot Hanar, the streets of the river. And then, not that we forgave him, but that was something that we could not step aside for. That was something that was ours as well. So let us go and meet Oritzvi Greenberg of after World War II. So in order to do that, I'm, these are the, the group of poems that I'm willing to, I'm, I'm proposing to look at. And I'd like to remind you again of the timeline because this is now crucial. So here is where we are. We are looking a little bit at the timeline of Oritzvi Greenberg from the time of his birth to his fighting in World War I, to his Aliyah, to the switch to the Beitar side, to the revisionist side uh, with all those poems and the book of uh, Accusation and Faith, a uh, Sefer Akitrug Ve'emona that we were just looking at. And now comes this, the famous silence, Neder Ha'elim, the commitment of a, how do you say, ilim, of dumbness, of mute, muteness, you know? During all eight years, Oritz Greenberg does not utter a word. He doesn't publish anything, anything whatsoever. You may want to remember 
that he was sent to Poland very, very close to the German invasion and to the beginning of World War II. And he leaves Poland very shortly before that, suggesting to take with him some family members, especially a nephew that we will come back to. It does not transpire, it does not come into being. And then there are the years that letters are still coming. And then there are the years that letters are not coming. And then there is the knowledge of what had happened and the total, really total loss of his family. And then comes the river streets, Rehovot Hanhar. And we will not go into the later poetry of Oritzvi Greenberg in our sessions. We will just concentrate on this. Because what I want you to look at is the part of the poetry on the left-hand side of your screen that is debatable, that people may agree or not agree, that people may belong or not belong. When you come to the right-hand side of our screen, that does not apply. It's not debatable. No matter where you are on the political or the ideological continuum, you recognize the value of this particular body of poetry, mainly the river streets, Rehovot and Har, the great lamentation of the Shoah. What I'd like you to note is that a, in that you will see poems that appear, I mean, 51 is when the book appears, Rehovot and Har. There were poems that were published in papers earlier like Kodesh Kodeshim, with which we will conclude next time, or the Crown of Lamentation, the first one to appear in 1945. We will talk to that in a moment. But what I want you to note, straight under the red sign of River Streets, 1951, you will see a poem, The Underground Dwellers. And this is 1931. So you may rightfully ask me and say, Rachel Rega, you said that we are going to deal with poems that are published after the great silence, after Neder Ha'elim, the commitment, the, the, the oath that he takes not to speak up. How come this poem from earlier? Well, here, by doing this, we are respecting the clear wish of Oritzvi Grimberg, who wanted his earlier 1931 poem to be included in Rehovot Nahar in River Streets, and to always be published as the first poem of a book that was written much later. Because Rehovot Nahar Streets of the River is written after the knowledge of what had happened in Europe is there. The underground dwellers, in a similar way to the land of the cross that we have looked at the kingdom of the cross, then Malchut from Salem, is an earlier poem prior to the Holocaust, and it's a horrible vision of a future that he had, and whether you want to call that his prophetic sense, whether you want to call that the extreme sensitivity of a poet's soul, but he actually indicated, asked for that to always be included in any publication of Rehovot Nahar. So we, of course, are respectful of that, even in our learning. Hey, okay, this you have seen, we are not talking about that. I'd like for us to look at some biblical texts as we are going into our study. So uh, here is it's Yechaskel. Veata ben Adam tsofe netaticha levet Yisrael. So thou, son of man, I have set thee watchman unto the house of Israel, therefore, etc., etc. When Uri Tzvi Grimberg will start writing after the Shoah, after the eight years of silence, he will put 
all his writing under the subtitle Sofe Levet Yisrael. He sort of names himself the watchman unto the house of Israel. And all his poetry of the post-Holocaust poetry will come under this title as the person who worries and who is out there to, to the lookout for the people of Israel. So this is one expression that I want for us to recognize as it will come into our discussion. Okay. All right, we move to the next one and the expression and it came to pass in the 12th years, the 10th month, in the fifth day of the month, that one that had escaped out of Jerusalem came unto me. Again, Ezekiel, but what I want you to note is the use of the expression palit the escaped one, because that will appear in the first poem that we are going to read. So I need for you to be aware of the biblical quote. And the last one is here as we look at verses 31, 32, 33. <laughs> And come unto thee as the people come and sit before thee as my people and there and hear thy words, but do them not, for with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goes after their covetousness. And we continue to the end. Uh, to 33, when this cometh to pass, behold, it cometh then, shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. And this is the notion that I want for us to take with us as we go into the post-Holocaust poetry of Oritzli Greberg. He sees himself as the guardian, the people out there on the outlook at Sofei Levet Yisrael. He recognized the notion of the palit, of the escaped one, that we all are actually after the Shoah. And he does want us to be aware, or we at least should be aware of his prophetic abilities that were not heeded that were not accepted, all right? So these are the three or four elements that Oretz Greenberg will tie into these biblical notions that I sort of wanted to create a vocabulary for us to look at. And here is that line double highlighted so you can see it. Later on, we will realize that we had a prophet amongst us. This is the cover of the book, the old cover of the book. Dan Meron, the great, the great uh, literary critic, had busied himself with Mossad Bialik uh, to the publication of all the works of Oritz V. Grimberg. And now we have other covers for the books. It was just finished about a year or two ago. But Rechovot Anahar, uh, that was published in 1951, I think that I have since the latter years of high school. So I graduated high school in 1964 and I had this book already by then. So people, this was the kind of book that if you were known in your family or amongst your friends or by your teachers as a lover of poetry and literature that I always was, a, somebody would buy you a copy of Rechovot HaNahar and will tell you, even if you were 15 or 16, that this is a tough one, but you need to read it because this is important, because this is the voice of our generation. Let me be absolutely 100% times clear. It was not taught in high school as I was a student. 
it is not taught in high school since it's considered too difficult, the language, not only people who do not have Hebrew find Ortsri Greenberg difficult to understand. It's difficult even for fluent Hebrew speakers. But it became a thing that if, if you knew Rechovot and Nahar, and the person that you were getting to know somehow mentioned to you that they too admired Rechovot and Nahar, then it was a link, it was a click, because it was a tough one, yet an important one. Okay. Ba'ei ba'machteret, the underground dwellers. A, I will want again a volunteer reader, and you will have to, to say it aloud because I cannot see all your little screens when I have my text on. So do I have a reader for this? It's a toughie, but we will need a reader for the English, of course. Judith? Yeah, I'll read it. Okay. Judith, okay. Right. Thank you, Judith. And I'm starting with the Ivrit, obviously, and I will call upon you to do the English. First of all, look at the title, the subtitle, Chazon Lelkait Tafresh Tzadik Aleph. And the English translation says a 1931 summer night vision. But of course, the Hebrew reader hears the Hebrew differently, even for the title, because how do you call Midsummer Night Dream in Ivrit? Oh, wow. I forgot. Chalom Leil Kaitz. And so Orisve Greenberg is playing on that because we have a Hebrew translation of the Shakespeare by then, more than one, by the way. And so you are used to the term Chalom Leil Kaitz. I'm gonna give you a Chazon Leil Kaitz, a vision of a summer night. Taf Reis Sadiq Aleph, 1931. Vehine ba hapalit. Ufanav mefukim uvam ayin achat ayuma uvafe mefulash kemo butak mikhere veze mesaper tevach dleka rak ani aniyut galmuda vata yudi odechad yudi batevel vani lo yadati ki yesh od echad yudi ואני פה והם שם הרוגי ושרופי ונתחי בין עליי כה עברתי הדם בגופי בגפי את האש. This will do of the Ivrit because as I told you hard even for the Hebrew speaker and let us go to the English. Please, Judy. Here comes the castaway, his face gushing with just one horrible eye and in it a mouth torn as if slashed by a sword. And he tells, massacre, fire, only me, a lonely entity. And you, a Jew? Is there another Jew in the world? And I did not know there was another Jew. I am here, they are there. My killed, my burnt, my parts. I cross the blood <coughs> with my shoes on, with my body all alone through the fire. Okay, let's stop here. Thank you, thank you. So first of all, the palit, the castaway uh, from Ezekiel, this is the language. The vision, the summer night vision, 1931, that exists only in the imagination of Orisvi Greenberg, is for a person who dwells underground, and we do not know if these are a metaphorical underground tunnels or something, or real ones. Somebody who does not they dare show their face on top of the earth, but is hiding underneath. Both options are possible readings of this. And then that person who dwells underground and you have a very graphic description of his mutilated face, to which critiques of Ulrich Greenberg and they exist, will speak out against that 
there was no need for these, they call it pornographic details of the horror. But I want you to remember this is not Rehovot Nahar, which was published in 51. This is from 20 years earlier. And the vision of the poet is that there are only two Jews left alive in the world. And then one of them will meet the other. And after we got the graphic description of what he looks like this one, and as he sees the second one, he says to him, I gave you again the quote of the Palit that we read earlier. I did not know that there was still another Jew in the world. Is there another Jew in the world? And I did not know there was another Jew. Now again, I, I don't need to repeat this time and again, you get the picture 31. When much later, 45 and on, we start hearing survivors, many will express this feeling that after what my eyes have seen, after what I have survived, I was sure that I was the only one left. And even if not the only one in the world, then the only one from my town, the only one from my family. And this is again a feeling that is hard to imagine how the poet that many years before can capture. The other thing that I want to notice is I'm here, they are there. My killed, my burned, my parts, Chalakai. The appropriation, the hugging of all the victims is a very characteristic poetic expression of the later Ulrich Grimberg post Holocaust poetry. Not all the people who write poetry about what had happened back in Europe. And remember, he is not there. This is not a survivor poet. This is more like a palit, a castaway, an escaped one, because he escaped the last moment from there. But the total togetherness with the victim. They are my people, my body, my parts, my family a very strong Ulrich Zwei Grimberg trait. And then he described how he crossed all the lands through blood and fire. Let's continue a little bit more. The notion, um, here he is. Here he is. Here he is falling asleep. He snores, his mouth ajar, his mouth an abyss. Midnight, this sleeping one is my brother. Tomorrow at light, he will know me for sure. His brother, sources of hot sulfur will swell in both his eyes. I will say to him, brother, come to the soil of lands. As long as we are alive with meek souls, we will walk underground and will set fire there. We will set it. So it thoroughly, so it thoroughly devours men's kingdoms. Let it feast. If they do not let us settle above the ground, this is where we will settle. A flock of Jews waiting for Mashiach with no shovel nor sword. Let us row ahead. My brother will answer. Okay. So here is the image that he sees and look at the recognition. Each one who will survive whatever catastrophe he sees in the vision of that summer night, they will be all brothers no matter how distant from each other, that will be the brotherhood of the plitim, the brotherhood of the survivors. And they will create their own kingdom of the meek underneath, maybe covered, maybe not known. Again, a metaphorical recognition that whoever survived is not really a full member of the rest of the world. There is some sort of a bubble, some sort of an underground existence 
that they all share. And if they do not let us settle above ground, this is where we will settle a flock of Jews waiting for Mashiach with no shovel nor sword. Let us throw ahead, my brother will answer. And this I pointed out to you. And this too, the recognition of the powerlessness of the Jews before no shovel, no sword, just waiting for Mashiach. Is there critique there? Is there just pain? And the brother will answer, and this is now, we are not going to do the whole poem. What I'd like to show you in the next phase is first of all, the date. So you have the paper of the date. It's Erev Rosh Hashanah, 1945. Okay, so I gave you a little bit of a quote from a Jerusalem Post, I think, or maybe an American paper. Jewish New Year begins tonight, first peacetime holiday in six years. So this is the first Erev Rosh Hashanah after the Holocaust. Okay, and Haaretz, again, not a kolayom, et cetera, the right-wing papers, but Haaretz, you know exactly where Haaretz is ideologically. And Uritz V. Greenberg publishes his poem in Haaretz on Erev Rosh Hashanah. And its title is Keter Kina Lechol Bet Yisrael, a crown of lamentation for the whole house of Israel. This will be the first inkling, the first thing that Oral Zvi Greenberg publishes after the Holocaust for Erev Rosh Hashanah, for Erev Yamim Noraim. And all those who were waiting for eight years to hear his voice, sometimes chastising him, no, where are you, great prophet? Where are you, great poet? Need to wait until this appears Keter Kina Lechol Bet Israel in Haaretz. This is the first one, and he gives it the title, which will somehow be the subtitle of the streets of the river. Nobody knows yet about the streets of the river. That will take two more years to be published, but this is the first inkling of that. As we are continuing, there is something that I need to show you. So this is the Chavot HaNahar, Keter Kina Lechol Bet Yisrael, A Crown of Lamentation, actually the subtitle of the book. Now, I want you just to look at something. We are not reading. I put on the screen the Hebrew of all Keter Kina Lechol Bet Yisrael. And I marked with a green frame the parts that we are going to look at. So I, English and Hebrew, of course. I want you to be aware of the fact that we are not reading the complete poem because it's impossible in the framework that we have. If we had a semester to do just Ulrich Zwei Greenberg, maybe we will do complete poems. But in our framework, I just want you to see that we are not doing the whole thing. Beseder? Okay. Again, I need for you to be aware of a biblical background. So this case, it's the Book of Lamentation, really not hard to guess why. Echa, 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 how did it come into being? And here is the first excerpt. And now you know that these are all nothing but excerpts. And imagine yourself, if you can, I don't know if you were around in 45, and if you were, you were still babies. I was not yet born. I came into the world in 46. But this is Erev Rosh Hashanah, the complexity of feelings and emotions, because by that time we know what had transpired, okay? Even if for many years we didn't know, now we do. And then if we live in Eretz Israel, you get your Rosh Hashanah paper, and you open it, and this is what you find. Again, I'm calling for a reader, maybe somebody else for this one. Very quickly, I don't want to waste time today. Do I have a Josie? Okay, we'll go with you, Josie, for this one. 
I'm just doing a little bit of the Ivrit. Keter kina lechol beit Yisrael. Ech huvlu. You can hear the echa tone, okay? Echa, how is it possible? And the ech in more modern Hebrew, but it's the same root. Ech huvlu derech mir'e livlu vivloim. יהודי היפים והם יודעים ורואים, הם למוות ורון של לבלוב עד גבוהים, אין כמירת רחמים תחת שמי אלוהים, תבל של גויים. So first of all, again, I want to repeat it, that the Hebrew of this is really difficult even for the native speaker. There are words that I needed to look up to make sure I understood them properly. What I want to take away from this first verse, and then we will go into the English, En kmirat rachamim tachat shmei Elohim tevel shel goyim. This is what we need to pay attention to as you are reading the English for us, Josie. How they were led through blooming pastures in rags, my beautiful Jews, knowing and seeing they to death while flourishing blindness. Sorry, there's some truck. Rose high, no mercy kindled under God's heavens. Goyim's universe. Okay, so look at that. I mean, every single line that he writes is worth of our attention but I will be picking up a few, and in this case, this very clear distinction. The universe is a goyim universe. So if you wanted to qualify Ulrich Greenberg, and I will take us back to a few minutes ago when I said that although the post-Holocaust writings of Ulrich Greenberg do not call for ideological splits. And yet I added, but his politics show through. And he will not accept any wishy-washy, not everybody was bad and they were good people. Nah. From his perspective, the world is against us. It's a goyim universe with no mercy. So two major notions criticized, no mercy kindled under God's heavens, a goyim universe. And look at these two words in this case, they work very well in the English, God and goyim. God had allowed his universe to become a goyim universe. You can hear even before you hear, I mean, you do hear the lamentation, Echa huvlu, how they were led. But even the conclusion of the first verse is a terrible anger. Let's continue. Knee deep in a sparkling creek, oxen wonder, why aren't they bellowing? Brightness and tree shadows on the road. The Jews are marching dark and nameless in the midst of darkness, tatters of their day turned into night. As if they do not belong here, they think. Birds hover over them unseeing. Did they ever have a mother? Was Shema Yisrael, our God is one, whispered over a breast for them. A raven also circles over them from a green tree. This is the dreadful fowl of fear from baby's dreams. It wants their heads. It shrieks so bitterly. Its beak turns to them. It shrieks. This is the verdict. Don't you get it? They do for a long time. Okay. Two notions that we want to take from here, maybe more than two. Just like God and the Goyim's universe in the first verse, in these coming verses, the nature sort of spits them out. The birds do not notice them. The oxen do not bellow maybe just the raven, they do not belong. So there is this disconnect with their surrounding, that land that they thought was their home, in which they felt at home, 
is not that anymore, that they turned into night and they do not be belong here. The birds do not see them. Just like the now reality is put under question mark, their past goes there as well. Did they ever have a normal life? Now that this is coming upon them, was ever a normal situation? Were there ever babies in their mother's lap with a Shema Israel whispered over them? They are not sure. I mean, the total disconnect the Shoah brings upon people a disconnectedness with the land, a disconnectedness with God, a disconnectedness with their own past, that absolute unacceptable reality of the Shoah makes you put everything under a question mark. Not just this is a horrible thing that is happening now. No, they do for a long time. One of the characteristics of Ulrich Greenberg approach to the Shoah that he rejected the word Shoah. He never used it. He was not agreeable to see it as a unique unprecedented event. He speaks of an ongoing set of pogroms. And therefore you will not see the word Shoah in Ulrich Greenberg's poetry. He does not and never did he accept the exclusivity of the Shoah of World War II. He insisted on seeing it as part and parcel of the whole Jewish history in the Goim's universe. I think this is a good moment for me to stop for today so that I can still give you three minutes in case you have any comments or questions so far before I take leave for the day. Judith, are you raising your hand? It's, yes. Yeah. And can I just check with you that this was actually written, the whole poem in 1931? Is that? No, no, no. This is already the 45. Ah, OK. This All is right. because at the Rosh Hashanah 45. I yeah, even told you right. The Seder? Ken, yeah. no, I, 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 now I understand. Underground dwellers of 31, we just paid respect to Ori Yitzvig Grimberg's right. wish to look at that poem before we start. And then we went straight ahead to the first poem mm -hmm. of the Streets of the River. The book is published Thank in you. one, but the first poem, Erev Rosh Hashanah, 1945. Okay. Right. Okay. It speaks to me very much the one before because I have had, I had an aunt who was a, a survivor uh, who wrote to my father, whom she didn't actually know, but knew of uh, when she was liberated and she was in Sweden. Um, wrote to my father in London, and he returned a letter with a photograph of me as a baby, and she wrote back, she said, when it, and she always told me all my life, when it came, she said, look, are there really Jewish children still born just like this? They thought they were the only people in the world, more or less. They didn't think that such a thing happened anymore. And, 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 and he knew that. Um, so very, I was very close. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. okay, thank you, Judith. I'll take Susan for today. Actually, it's all. So let me just ask, uh, Rachel, how was this poem received when it appeared in Haaretz by the Israeli public? All of Rechovot HaNahar is received with awe. Remember, we do not have a lot of Holocaust poetry at the time at all. He is yes. one of the first, you know? We have very, very little, and if so, mainly admiring the Gvora, the uprising. And, but in 51, not even that. He is immediate. It's all raw. And it's received with awe, with shock, with a mixture of emotions. But the one thing that doesn't come into it, it doesn't matter whether he is a revisionist or socialist Zionist. This now erases the fences, the ideological fences, and he becomes the voice of crown of lamentation. Absolutely, I mean, I cannot, a, it is not received with pleasure, of course, but very respected, very mm. respectfully. That would be a better term. And thank you for your question. Yeah. Yeah. Chavirim, 
As I said, I need to cut this short today. So thank you for being here. We will continue and conclude with Ulrich Greenberg, the Omer series next week. I wish you all Shabbat Shalom and all of us a well-deserved peaceful time after these horrible 10 or 12 days. Tudarabha, everybody.